Matchbox 20 would be one of several bands that came from Florida during the mid to late 90s and dominated rock radio as well as MTV. Their debut album was a massive success, selling in excess of 12 million copies just in America. Despite being commercially successful, critics blasted the band as being too bland and faceless while hipsters simply called them uncool. It was something that wasn't lost on the band, with frontman Rob Thomas telling Billboard magazine, Our saving grace has been that we're not hip. There's a lot of bands and the best thing about them is they're them. It's never been hip to be us. Today, let's take a look at whatever happened to Matchbox 20. Long before Matchbox 20 hit it big, frontman Rob Thomas thought he'd someday be a big star. In fact, one of my favorite stories profiling the band came from Spin Magazine, who wrote a profile on the group in 1999, saying, A few years ago, when their record sales were a lot closer to 12,000 instead of 12 million, and whose popularity didn't extend much outside their home base of Orlando, Matchbox 20 wanted more than anything to be flashy, conventional rock stars. They'd even show up to early morning flights in glitzy stage outfits, dark sunglasses, and long furry coats. When custom officials asked them to cite their occupations, singer Rob Thomas would always state, rock star, if they looked at him skeptically, he would airily assure them, trust me, I'm huge, trust me. Born on a US Army base in Germany to a sergeant father and an alcoholic mother, Matchbox 20 frontman Rob Thomas had a very rough childhood. By the time he was a toddler, his parents had divorced, his mom would then take his older sister to live in Columbia, South Carolina, and Thomas would be shuttled off to rural South Carolina to hang out with his grandmother, who was also an alcoholic. His grandmother would run a general store where she sold pot and moonshine under the counter. Then there's his aunt Monkey, who famously hired in 1975 serial killer Pee Wee Gaskins to kill her ex-boyfriend. She would go to prison for 30 years and soon started a relationship with Gaskins. By the time Thomas was 10, he would move back in with his sister and mother to a trailer park in Orlando. But his mom kept some pretty rough company partying and hanging out with bikers who would sometimes beat her up and she would take her frustrations out on Rob. Parties were a pretty common sight at Thomas's home and a young Rob would even sometimes play bartender. It wasn't uncommon for him to wake up the next morning and be surrounded by 10 or more bodies and his older sister Melissa would soon decide she had enough and ran away from home at the age of 17. And it was around this time that their mother would be diagnosed with cancer, but she still continued to drink and smoke. The doctors would give Thomas's mother six months to live, with him telling the LA Times, that aged me quickly. But his mother would beat the odds, pulling through her cancer ordeal. Amongst all the chaos in his family life, Rob found music at a pretty young age, getting his first instrument at the age of 10, which was a Casio keyboard. His early years in South Carolina would convince him that he wanted to be a songwriter, taking cues from old country greats before getting into Billy Joel, Elton John, The Cure, as well as Elvis Costello. He would recall to Rolling Stone how he was a nerd in school and soon started writing his own music in hopes of becoming one of the cool kids saying, At parties all the football players would be drunk and passed out, and I'd be in the living room with all their girlfriends around me, playing the piano, every song like a bad version of a Lionel Richie solo album. It was in high school Thomas would end up playing in a few cover bands, one of which was named Fair Warning. But by the time he got to his senior year, he would quit school after Fair Warning got a residency, performing at a local Sheridan hotel. But the band quickly blew their opportunity after several of their members were caught stealing food and drinks from the hotel. What followed next was Thomas leaving home at the age of 17 and spending the next three years living homeless, roaming the area between South Carolina and Florida, where he would spend his days crashing at friends' homes and on park benches while finessing his musical skills on guitar and piano. He would also take up odd jobs, including working at a biker bar, where he soon became known as a singing busboy. Despite the difficult set of circumstances of those years living on the streets, it would give Thomas some wisdom with him telling the LA Times, there were times when it seemed rough, but all these kids at school were like drunk jerks and freaks with beer keggers. Maybe if I hadn't been homeless, I wouldn't have started thinking clearly until I was out of college. In my head, I was older, older than everybody my age. Despite thinking that he was wiser than his peers, Thomas did do a lot of stupid things. He would end up serving two months in jail, and at one point he took so much acid that he severely burned his hands on dry ice, to the point that the doctors thought they would have to amputate his hands. By the early 90s, Thomas would eventually move back to Florida where he met several other like-minded musicians who were also underemployed, including bassist Brian Yale and drummer Paul Doucette. They would enlist a few other local musicians and form the band Tabitha Secret. 
but shortly after forming, Doucette would quit the band and head back to Pittsburgh to work at a car dealership. It was during a trip that Doucette took back down to Florida to retrieve his belongings that he was driving on the highway at 75 miles per hour to result in him rolling his vehicle. And while he would be okay, it would be while he waited for his car to be fixed that he learned that his replacement in Tabitha Secret had quit, so he offered to fill in for a few shows before deciding to stay permanently. The band soon hit the club circuit around Florida, and their sets at this point in time consisted of the future Matchbox 20 song, 3AM. Doucette, Thomas, and Yale would end up leaving Tabitha Secret and started a new band called Matchbox 20, while recruiting guitarists Adam Gaynor and Kyle Cook. Doucette would explain to MTV how the band came up with their name, recalling, A guy walked into the place I was working, and I wish I knew who this guy was, because I have no clue. He had a big number 20 on his softball shirt, a bunch of patches all over it, and the only word that I saw from the patches was the word Matchbox. And I was like, Matchbox 20. At that time I wanted to start a clothing company, I was like Matchbox 20 clothing company. But then I said the name of the band. Initially Rob Thomas hated the name, but a month later they finally decided to use Matchbox 20. The band soon caught the attention of producer Matt Seraletic, who had a deal with Atlantic Records subsidiary Lava Records. He had previously worked with Elective Soul, and he would introduce the band to Atlantic Records, who signed the group under their subsidiary Lava Records. The group's first album, Yourself or Someone Like You, would be inspired by Thomas's failed relationships and his terrible childhood. 3AM dealt with his tumultuous relationship with his mother, while the song Push dealt with one of his troubled relationships, while Real World comes to terms with one's limitations. Their debut album, which came out in 1996, would be put out the same week that their label Lava Records closed its doors. The band soon started to worry that maybe they would be dropped, and they soon start to think about their futures. But Atlantic Records soon noticed something strange. The group's album sales had spiked in Birmingham, Alabama, of all places. The spike in sales was attributed to a local station, WRAX, who started playing the song Push. The band was soon absorbed by Atlantic Records, and the label issued Push as a single and shot a video for MTV. And soon enough, the single became a top five hit, and three more singles soon followed, including Real World and 3AM, both of which were top 10 hits, and Back to Good, which was a top 25 hit. The single that made Matchbox 20 a household name would be the song Push. The song's lyrics about a troubled relationship came to Thomas during his first trip to New York City, but it also drew a lot of criticism from some feminist groups, specifically from New Hampshire, who called for radio stations to stop playing the song. Thomas would push back against these assertions, saying, This song isn't a call for physical violence, but rather the observations of the emotional battles a relationship goes through. Thomas would claim the song was inspired by a relationship which he was the one who was mistreated, not the woman. Thomas would recall to the LA Times watching MTV News one day and seeing an ex-girlfriend of his being interviewed, claiming to be the inspiration behind the song Push, and threatening to sue Matchbox 20 for unpaid royalties. Luckily for him, she wasn't serious and no lawsuit would be filed. In reality, the song was about a different high school girlfriend who broke up with Thomas by donating his possessions to Goodwill, with him telling the LA Times, I had no clothes, nothing. All the local bands got together and gave me their band t-shirts. For months, that's all I wore. The success of the band's first album would result in them being all over MTV and rock radio, but Matchbox 20 still had an identity problem. Despite People Magazine naming Rob Thomas one of their 50 most beautiful people of the year in their 1998 issue, MTV would send a camera crew to one of the band's shows, asking attendees to simply name one of the band members. Many people couldn't answer the question. So how did the band feel about this whole identity problem? While Thomas saw it as a vindication that the band's music was more important than their image, while other members couldn't believe it, as they all appeared in their own music videos. The band's success soon saw them lumped in with the likes of the County Crows and Hootie and the Blowfish, with the LA Times writing on their profile of the band, Matchbox 20, like the Counting Crows and Hootie, has sold millions of records by approximating the sound of an earlier era, which makes their music reassuring for listeners who moan about the loss of classic songwriting values in rock. Some of the critics weren't kind to the band, though. Their detractors referred to the band as corporate radio fluff. Even some of their rock heroes were less than supportive. In fact, Thomas would meet one of his idols, Keith Richards, who he hoped would compliment Matchbox 20's music. Instead, Thomas recalled Richards saying, Oh, you're the one with the wife referring to his wife who's a fashion model. Then you had fellow musicians who came up during the same time disrespecting Matchbox 20. In perhaps the most 90s feud, Third Eye Blind frontman Steven Jenkins would slam Thomas in the press. Matchbox 20's tour for their first album saw Thomas gain about 20 pounds, and at one point Jenkins called Thomas fat, to which Thomas responded in an interview with Spin saying, 
I don't care who knows it, Stephen Jenkins made fun of me, called me fat, called me a fat guy. Screw you, he has no soul whatsoever. Thomas would tell Rolling Stone how the success of the group's debut album took its toll on him personally, saying, I was the only person ever with a coke habit to gain 50 pounds. We did an MTV Live from the 10 spot, and that was the first time I had a good look at myself in a while. Not only was I heavy, but I had dark eyes, my face was all puffy. That was pretty effed up. I'd met my future wife at that point, and she showed the tape to her mother. Her mother was like, why the F were you going out with that guy? He's ugly. Thomas would end up curtailing his habits, and the band's first album would go on to sell a whopping 12 million copies stateside, but it also came with one additional headache. The man who's on the front cover of the group's debut album would end up suing Matchbox 20, claiming they didn't get his permission to put his likeness on the record. The lawsuit would come nearly a decade after the album came out, and it appeared to go nowhere. That wasn't the only legal scare the band had, as several of their former bandmates in Tab of the Secret also filed a lawsuit against Matchbox 20 over songwriting royalties. The writing sessions for the band's second album proved to be difficult initially. Thomas, up until this point in the band's history, would write a majority of the songs, and the second album was really no different. In fact, at some point, song suggestions from his bandmates, namely Paul Doucette, ended with screaming matches between both musicians, and at one point Thomas would even put up a sheet in the studio with song ideas for Doucette's solo record. The band would eventually work through their issues and problems, and their second record titled Mad Season would end up being put out in the year 2000. The lead single Bent proved to be a huge hit. It was the same year that the band changed their name from Matchbox 20 to Matchbox 20, citing groups like Blink-182 as being an example of there being too many bands with numbers in their names. The record label would end up teaming up with America Online in 1999 to create what Billboard referred to as a band area where fans could listen to the new album, watch videos of their songs, get information on their latest tour, and the band members in turn would help AOL with their new service called You've Got Pictures by judging a digital picture contest. Mad Season, while successful, would sell about a third of the copies of the group's previous album, but the group and their label seemed to be pleased with its four times platinum performance. Rob Thomas would tell Billboard about the band's second album, Mad Season did a lot better than we thought it would considering we didn't come out with an in-your-face record. That was our headspace at the time. Everyone was so quick to tell you that it's hard to repeat the success. The band's management was also quick to point out that Mad Season outsold its predecessor in territories outside the US, including the UK and Japan. And the album would also help establish Matchbox 20 as a bigger touring act, as the group would sell out Madison Square Garden in just 15 minutes following the album's release. It was during the time the band was working on Mad Season that Rob Thomas would be involved in not just one of the most successful songs of 1999 or even the decade, but one of the most successful songs of all time. Songwriter Ittle Sure would send guitarist Carlos Santana a demo for a song called Smooth, and Santana felt the song needed more work, so his label, Arista Records, would send the song to Thomas, who wrote the first verse and worked with Sure to flush out the song. Thomas would temporarily put his vocals on the track, while Santana and his label were supposed to find a big name vocalist. One name I saw floated around at the time was George Michael. But after hearing Rob Thomas's vocal on the track, Santana wanted him to sing on the song. The song would prove to be a massive hit, spending 13 consecutive weeks on the pop charts in the summer of 1999 and winning three Grammy Awards. Smooth is ranked as the third most successful song ever on Billboard's greatest of all time Hot 100 songs list. But the success that Thomas was having outside of Matchbox 20 left his bandmates with mixed emotions. His bandmates would tell Spin Magazine that they would never play Smooth live, with Doucette telling the publication, it was weird watching the Grammys that the four of us weren't up there too. Our career started together and he's having a pinnacle of a career moment and he's totally doing it without us too. I was really torn, but God, I was really effing proud of my friend. It was following the success of Smooth and of course Matchbox 20's first two albums that Thomas began fielding calls from other popular musicians, including Mark Anthony, Willie Nelson, and of course one of the biggest rock stars on the planet, Mick Jagger. The Rolling Stones frontman at the time was working on his 2001 solo record, Goddess in the Doorway, and enlisted Thomas to help him write a few songs. The pair would come up with several songs, including Visions of Paradise, which wound up on Jagger's solo album, but it would also be another track named Disease, which found its way on Matchbox 20's third album, More Than You Think You Are. The band's third album would see the group utilize common lyrical themes that were found on their past records, including abandonment, love, as well as redemption, 
but at the same time they also explored some new sounds including psychedelic influences on the track You're So Real and more gospel influences on the song Downfall. The band for their part had long seen trends come and go and their storied career proved that they had longevity with Thomas telling the Orlando Sentinel, when we first came out there was all this stuff like Pearl Jam and Nirvana, a big heavy grunge movement. We stayed under the radar and kept going. Next there was Super Pop with Britney Spears and the Backstreet Boys, then back to Limp Bizkit and Lincoln Park. We never attached ourselves to any movement. To prevent himself from being influenced by what was popular on radio at the time, Thomas would tell Billboard he didn't listen to the radio during the entire writing sessions for the group's third record. He would tell the magazine, this record was all about old Elton John, Tom Petty, Fleetwood Mac, Billy Joel. This time it was all about getting the guitar sound that we grew up with in the 70s. The band at the same time also criticized some of their old records with Thomas telling the Orlando Sentinel. As we went back and listened to our other records, sonically there was something missing for us. The quality of the guitars and the drums didn't sound organic to us, it's so processed. The record also proved to be more of a collaborative approach, with Thomas getting more help from his bandmates in the songwriting department. More Than You Think You Are would go on to sell 2 million copies, and the following year the band would take a much needed hiatus, whilst members focused on other musical projects. It was during the band's time off, Thomas' mother would pass away in 2006. Despite having repaired their relationship, they still had some difficult moments with Thomas telling Rolling Stone that she'd sometimes show up drunk to his concerts only for him to have her removed. Their difficult relationship even soon started affecting Thomas's marriage. For a long time, the frontman kept pretty quiet about his mother and their relationship for fear of upsetting her. Producer Matt Seraletic would tell Rolling Stone he had a strange relationship with his mother. He'd run from her but also wanted her approval. She was half crazy and very loving and yet very vindictive. A lot of it had to do with his marriage. It's one of those things that was never quite approved of. And then when she died three years ago, he simply fell apart. 2007, the band would reunite without Adam Gaynor. Interesting fact you guys may not know is that Gaynor would appear on the show Millionaire Matchmaker in 2012. Following the reunion of the band, they would put out their first compilation album titled Exile on Mainstream, which consisted of a new EP of seven songs and 12 remastered tracks would peak at number three on the Billboard album charts, selling over half a million copies, going gold. The album's lead single, How Far We've Come, would peak at number 11 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts, and it was following the tour to support the album, Thomas put out his second solo record, Cradle Song, while his bandmates worked on new material for their next Matchbox 20 album. The band would put out their latest record in 2012, titled North. The band would write upwards of 50 songs and go on a $100,000 bender, mostly spending money on expensive bottles of wine before they'd even recorded any songs. The members disagreed over which direction to take the band's fourth record, and it wasn't until their old producer and friend Matt Serletic checked in on the band's progress that he was enlisted to help produce the record and get things back on track. The resulting record titled North would be the band's first album to debut at the number one spot in the Billboard album charts, selling 95,000 copies in its first week and going on to become certified gold. The band will spend the next decade touring, with them announcing in June of last year on social media that they have begun work on their fifth album. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, see you again in Rock Roll Your Stories, sticker.